Hello, my name is Jane and I'm a 3D artist at Chaos. And in this video I'm going to show you how to deform fire and liquid simulations. And how you can use IPR to fine-tune simulations, shade mist particles and more. Let's start with a simple campfire scene, in which we have some firewood and some rocks surrounding it. We'll start by using a burning fuel preset on the firewood to get things started. And we'll run the simulation. Simulation recording is fast forwarded for this tutorial. Once the simulation is done, we'll start the IPR on CPU. So far IPR on GPU supported the Phoenix simulators, but if you have better CPU you can take advantage of it. Let's check how our campfire looks and see the renderer. It interactively updates through the timeline or just when looking around it. It's not bad, but it will need a few tweaks, due to the physical camera exposure we use in this scene. We will open the Volumetrics option window. And as we can see now, by default it is pinned. So we can select other objects in the scene, while the window stays active. We can select the plane or the rocks, and we can see the pinned window stays open and active. We'll increase the fire multiplier a bit and see how it interactively updates in the frame buffer. The same thing happens when we tweak the temperature graph, it updates interactively. Another thing we want to tweak is the velocity of the fire. Because we have used fuel preset, it is a little bit too intense now for a campfire. As we can see, the volumetric options window stays on top and active, which is very convenient. We'll decrease the outgoing velocity to a quarter and we'll click simulate to apply this new velocity to the fire scene. When the scene is being calculated, we can see the fire temperature update in the graph. Let's check how it looks. It looks good, but we need to increase the fire multiplier a bit more and we still have the options window open, which is great. We'll put it to 30 for now. Now that we're happy with it, we can close the volumetric options window. Now that our fire is more confined, we can optimize the simulation a bit by excluding the heavy geometry of the rocks from the simulation. We now have the option to not only pick single objects, but we can add many objects to the scene interaction rollout at once, which is now optimized and much faster way to add hundreds of objects instantly. Now that we have excluded the geometry from the calculation, our simulation will speed up a bit. We can use this advantage to increase the grid resolution of it, for a better detail. As you can see, we have the option to expand some of the simulation rollouts, dock them and move them around floating, so we can have access to them all the time, no matter which object is selected. We can adjust the resolution, even when the simulator is not active or selected, which is really convenient. We can try a bit higher, but let's stick to 1 million voxels for now. There are other rollouts that can be expanded as well, thanks to their updated interface, which also loads them much faster. Let's run our sim again and check how it looks. It's much more like a campfire now, but we can add a little trick to it. Phoenix simulators now support some deformation modifiers like bend, skew, taper, twist, melt or stretch. Let's first turn off the GPU preview. This is in order to see the effect in the viewport better. We'll add a twist here to give the fire a tornado fire blizzard cool effect. Let's adjust the twist and see how it looks. In order to see the effect, we can either use the production render or IPR as preferred. One thing to have in mind when using modifiers on our simulator is best to avoid using adaptive grid for the simulation, as this might cause the modifier to flicker. 
let's calm our fire a bit and make it more romantic by trying a taper modifier on top of it to get a more pointy fire. We can animate the modifier parameters as usual and the animation will be applied to the simulation properly. In this example, we don't want the taper to affect the fire in the beginning. Let's check the result. Let's see how some of those features apply to the liquid simulators and let's check some of the new stuff when simulating liquids. We'll use a simple scene based on Stormy Sea preset and we can use the crate as an active body dropping in the water. We have pre-simulated the scene for the purpose of this tutorial. In the splash rollout we now have splash split setting, which adjusts if the splashes are separated into many more smaller drops as they travel. We can see in this render how it looks when we split them as much as possible with the value of 1.0. We'll test how it looks now with the value of 0.01, which will leave fewer but larger splashes. We'll need to run the simulation again, which we did in advance, in order to see the results right away. And the difference is obvious. Let's check our frame buffer history to compare the renders. We can see how in one of the renders there are much more and smaller splashes, while in the other there are fewer but larger splashes. We can slide between them and check the drops in the air in front of the crate. Let's check now how we can deform water simulator meshes similar to the campfire scene we did, we did earlier. Now we can add some modifiers to the liquid simulators. In this case, I have prepared two bent modifiers with adjusted direction and gizmo to best show our case. We can turn them on one by one to see how it affects our stormy sea. It is pretty cool, we can use it as a huge wave building behind our crate and then we can animate the modifier parameters as well, thus allowing more control. Let's check what our other bend allows us to do. We have rotated the gizmo 90 degrees this time and if we increase the angle we get an interesting water funnel so we can adjust the laws of physics to our liking. Let's check how it looks in the render. As you can see, the particle splashes, foam and mist are all affected by the modifiers together with the liquid they belong to. Let's play a bit with the splashes and mist now. We have introduced some new customizations for the mist particle shader. Let's make sure we have ray traced scattering in order for the face function to be available. While the absorption color is available for all the modes of the mist. It acts as the absorption color of all volumetrics, with just the color we want to hide and absorb. And it leaves visible the inverse color. So the darker the color, the more opaque or denser the volume will be. And if we make it red, our mist will turn up a tone of cyan or blue. Let's region render just the mist. We can also adjust the face function similar to the face of smoke color volumetrics to adjust the contrast between light and shadow as desired. In this way, it controls the direction in which the light will scatter inside the volume. And let's make the mist even more cyan and bright. It looks much more natural now. Ok, let's say we have a flat ocean as far as the eyes can see. As you might know, so far we have used the grid to simulate precisely what we need and we can generate procedural infinite ocean outside the grid, depending on the different scene scenarios. There were cases where the border between the simulation grid and the ocean was distinctive. Well, not anymore. We now have a border fade setting to make a seamless transition. In this case, we on purpose set the ocean level to be much higher in order to create a fringe between the grid and the infinite ocean. We can now clearly see the border between the simulator 
and the ocean, in the viewport as well as in the render. I suppose we could even use this defect as an effect in some case. But when we put the fade, for example, to 50, it gradually disappears. This can be really useful in a lot of scenarios. And we'll look at one more now, but first, let's check how it looks in the render. A common case in which border fade is really useful is if, like in this pre-simulated example, we have simulated really strong waves inside the grid. And as we can see, if we put the value of the border fade to zero, we get a really distinctive fringe. We can see it in the render and in the viewport. Once we increase it and adjust it as desired, we can see the transition becomes seamless and fade properly, even affecting the particles of the liquid. Increasing it even further always helps, but we have to be careful not to fade too much of the grid and the detail in it. Those are some of the cool features and tricks we have in Phoenix. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and find it useful, and if so, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. Mm -hmm.